remind people all the time, you really want to be godly. You really want to stand with him. Look at the apostle Paul. When he died, he was all alone. I mean, in second Timothy, which is his last book before he's beheaded, he says, I got nobody. I mean, he wrote Romans 15, 20 years earlier. Here he is in Rome and there's nobody. He says to Timothy, would you mind coming all the way across the Mediterranean so you can bring my coat to me? Cause I'm cold. Like, that you're all I got, man. Well, welcome to the episode today, folks. I'm very honored and privileged to have uh, Ken Harrison with us today. Uh, Ken is the CEO of Promise Keepers. Uh, I'm sure everybody knows about that organization. Uh, his uh, mission is to provide executive leadership, strategic direction to the ministry, and uh, just to inspire men uh, to be bold for Jesus, humble and ambitious about their faith. Uh, he's also got his hand in some other things. He also serves as the CEO of Waterstone. It's a Christian foundation that uh, donates a million dollars a week to help build God's kingdom. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, Ken is also an author. Uh, he's written a couple of books. So the first book was... Uh, Rise of the Servant Kings, what the Bible says about being a man in his latest book, uh, Daring Faith in a Cowardly World. So I uh, really like that title. You know, it's you're not on the fence about that one, are you, Ken? <laughs> Happily named for the conversation we're about to have. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. Well, I appreciate your time today and uh, uh, all the things, you know, we could just jump in. Uh, recently, you've been in the news about... Uh, Belmont University, you had uh, one of the Promise Keepers events. Y'all are doing live events now. Again, COVID's kind of behind us, and you've got a couple events I know scheduled, uh, I believe in Texas and New York, but you had one scheduled in Belmont. So what, hap what happened with that situation? Well, we put out a statement for Pride Month in early June that just basically had four points to it. It said that uh, marriage is between a man and a woman that gender has become an idol to our culture and that God created male and female. Um, thirdly, that Jesus forgives all sinners who come to him. And uh, fourth, that living for Christ is countercultural and difficult. And then all the scriptures that go with them. And that apparently was so controversial to Belmont that they canceled us. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. That's just really basic uh, biblical truth that yeah. a generation ago, nobody would even raise an eyebrow about. So they counseled it. What's what was uh uh what was your response back to them? Did you have a dialogue with them? Was this I mean to schedule an event? It, I, I know it takes preparation. There's back and forth, and you just don't snap your fingers and put something like yeah. this together. Yeah, I mean you understand that was a big deal, and we had a signed contract. We had put a lot of money. We had announced it to our people, and so when they canceled, they just sent us an email. Um, I got it late at night, this sort of very brief email to their credit. They told us why they canceled when we, when we investigated, but they wouldn't talk to us, um, except for the one conversation I had. And we reached out and really we got, had to get more and more out of it. I reached out to the president and said, listen, we were supposed to start selling tickets. Our people want to know what's going on. We have to give them an explanation. You've canceled us. And I'd, I'd really like to do this with you. And I, at the time, uh, we didn't want to have any confrontation. I really, I believe Romans when it says, in as much as it has to do with you, be at peace with all men. And so I really took that seriously. And um, so we reached out, reached out, finally got a hold of one vice president, um, had a very nice conversation with her uh, and said, let's do this together. Let's release a press release together. Don't want to bring a bunch of untowed um, controversy to you. And she said, yeah, she was very happy with the conversation and said, yeah, let me go back to my colleagues. And I said, well, I need to hear back from you right away. And I didn't hear back for another six days. And we contacted, contacted emails, voicemails that just got ignored by the school. So we finally put out a press release um, saying what happened. Belmont released a press release a few days later because they, they got a lot of pushback. And it was a, it was a lie. I mean, they blatantly lied and said that Many of their leaders had talked to many of Promise Keepers leaders 
there's only one promise keepers leader and that's me <laughs> so you know it was it was like shocking and so then i flew out to nashville i met with some some board members had a nice meeting they promised me that there would be some changes at belmont we'll see. And I told them, look, I'm not going to attack Belmont anymore. I, I will have interviews that people want to talk about it. I'll talk about it, but this isn't my issue. I have promise keepers to run Waterstone to run. There's a call in my life and that call is not Belmont. So y'all, you, you do what you need to do and you, you can expect that I'm not going to make this into a big issue. I'm going to move on other than giving basic uh, instructions. So that's what, that's where we're at. Now, since Belmont, we've learned this is a much bigger problem. We've been canceled by a bunch more people. I'm going to put out a release on that soon. And God is changing. Uh, he's using this for his glory, which, you know, you and I were talking off camera. That's the story of the Bible. It's it's the Lord taking evil. It's taking Satan's plans and turning it for his glory. So we've had much better institutions, much bigger institutions call and invite us, say, hey, Belmont may not want you but we'd like you. And as soon as we have those put together, I'm going to keep my mouth quiet till we actually have it signed. But we have had some awesome institutions come to us and say, well, we'll stand with you. And what a glory to the Lord to see. And what a glory to some of these institutions, once we're able to announce them, that they still have the backbone to stand in there with Christ and say, the world may be saying promise keeper stance isn't okay, but God's word hasn't changed and we're still going to stand on God's word. And so I'm looking forward to being able to announce the new places as soon as we get the details ironed out. Yeah. It's so sad to see institutions, uh, Christian institutions, uh, really bend to culture instead of bend to Christ. Uh, you know, God has not changed his views on marriage, um, sexuality, biblical manhood, uh, all those things are still true. But, uh, you know, mm -hmm. culture seems like these they get infiltrated. They get, you know, not just Belmont liberal professors in there. And, you know, it all looks Christian on the outside with everything else. But once you start getting into the weeds, you find a different story with a lot of these institutions now. Yeah, Ken, we're seeing that. It's been an education for me. I mean, I I come from a very conservative strain of, of Christianity. Um and I knew that there was some corruption within the church, but I had no idea the level of it. And also had no idea of the level of hypocrisy. And so what we're seeing is a lot of institutions, and I'm talking big ministries. I, I'm, I'm at the point close to starting to give names, but at this point, I'll still, you can't ever take it back once you say it, right? Right. Big ministries, big Christian schools. Yeah. Big churches. I mean, there's a lot of big churches and the people who are going there and giving them a lot of money have no idea that these places uh, are, are giving different faces. And that's just the hypocrisy. So to their donors, they're saying one thing and and they're praising Jesus and they're saying they're doctrinally sound. And then over here, they're completely compromised with the world. And it's a it's a sad and it reminds me of Malachi chapter two, where Jesus said or where God says, Hey, you priests, I'm going to spread animal entrails on your faces because you're not preaching my word to my people. My people are being misled because you aren't taking a stand. Boy, that chapter, Malachi chapter two, is applicable to the church today in many regards. We've got to get back to the fact that just because cultural changes, God didn't change. And Jesus promised, if you stand on my word, you will be hated by the world. Well, when we see Christian institutions compromising to make sure they stay popular, Boy, we're out of step with who he is and what he wants from us. Mm, yeah. And, you know, the ministries and ministers, you know, God's word declares, you know, we're going to be held at a higher standard. You know, it's not that your average Christian. And when you see uh, mainline denominations starting to go down that path of rejecting the authority of the scriptures, start ordaining, um, you know, homosexual ministers, uh, uh, transgender ministers, uh, yeah. even in the churches have drag queen story hour. I mean, you know, sometimes I wake up, Ken, I think, well, what am I going to read today? That's just going to shock me even more. Nothing. You know, it's just, um, where we're at. You know, Ken, I, I'd make two statements on that. The first one is from a sort of worldly wisdom statement. 
you know, after I was a Los Angeles policeman, I was a businessman and I built a very large company. So I think about things in a branding sense. If I'm trying to sell you a product, what, why should you buy my product? Right. So from that sense of things, I look at even these institutions and I say, well, if I run a church that just looks like the world, why would anybody want to come to my church? What's the point? I mean, right. I mean, if a church doesn't stand on truth, well, why, why? And I, it, it sort of stretched my head. I guess people want the culture. They want someplace to go on Sunday where they can play religion. It's Laodicea in Revelation chapter three. But I sort of wonder why, what, what do you, what do you exist for? On the godly standpoint, you know, Jesus says to the overcomer in Revelation chapter two, I will give him permission to come and sit on my throne at my father's right hand. Does he say that to everybody? No, he says it to the overcomer, Will. The overcomer of what? The overcomer of the world. So to the person who stands on God's word and is maybe hated, well, not maybe, Jesus said will be hated when he's backstabbed. Jesus says, blessed are you when people persecute you and say all kinds of evil things about you. Rejoice. Great is your reward in heaven. Okay, so what am I doing to get this great reward? I'm standing on God's truth to the point that people say evil things about me and persecute me. And so I wouldn't challenge Christians. This is our call. The, the Jesus said, the world's going to hate you because it hated me. Second Corinthians says that you are like the scent of life to those going to life and the stench of death to those going to death. Man, when you, when you come around people who rejected Christ, who, who reject scripture, you smell bad, man, and they don't want you around. And if you don't smell bad to those people, then you're doing something wrong. And then lastly, I would say, Jesus started off the Sermon on the Mount by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. And then the next one is, blessed are those who mourn. You know, when you get to the state of the conversation we're having, I think there's a natural thing in each one of us where our hearts break. Our hearts break for our country. They break for our kids and our grandkids. And they break for the people we see around us who are lost and you know, I went to the coffee place this morning and I saw a kid with, you know, clearly confused and dressed all strange and gave stuff all over him. And, and I just, my heart breaks for him. And I think, who's telling you the truth, son? Like who, who's really reaching out to you? Is there anybody in your life that's giving you a positive influence? And so you, you mourn those things. You don't want to make people conform to what you believe. You want to give people truth and let them make a choice. And unfortunately today in America, there are a lot of people trying to make sure that we can't even give them the choice. And there are a lot of people who are representing themselves as ministers of Christ who are taking away that choice because they're not preaching the truth. And so the truth is, look, this is what the God's word says. You could take it or leave it. But my job is to tell you what it says in love and in grace and to give you the freedom to accept the Lord Jesus and accept scripture and follow him or not. But boy, if I'm acting like someone who's telling me the truth, but telling you a lie, shame on me. I mean, you quoted James earlier that, that those of us who represented ourselves as leaders in the church better be careful because we have a better reward coming to us, but we also have a stricter judgment coming to us if we're not representing our Lord um, properly. Well, let's maybe kind of shift gears a minute, Ken, uh, to your personal life, brother. Um <laughs> thoroughly enjoyed uh, a daring faith in a cowardly world uh great book uh and you share a lot of personal stories but you uh you kind of had a life-changing experience um back in 97 you got hit by a wave runner uh and uh that kind of rang your bell a little bit even though you were a police officer you saw death and uh, crime and all that uh drug addiction so Maybe kind of share that story with the audience. You know, I think when you get complacent, you'd better be careful because um, you can get stuck there. And so, um, yeah, having been a policeman in Compton, South Central Los Angeles, and and been in a lot of shootings and really seen death uh, up close and, and faced death many times, but always in a sea of adrenaline um, where, um, it, you know, as a police officer in a place like that, it all happens so fast that it's over before you really register what occurred, you know? So by the time you were registered, I almost, I could have died. You're already, you know, having a beer with the boys and laughing about it. Right. And there's that machismo that happens to, to process. Um, so I thought I knew everything about death until I got hit by a wave runner. And, uh, I remember the, 
I, I don't know if I said this in the book, but I was, I was riding along thinking, man, I'm looking around me all over the place. It was uh, Labor Day weekend. And I see all these people drinking and driving their boats. This is probably not a safe place to, oh, and I get hit by a drunk guy on a wave runner. And uh, it broke all the ribs on the right side of my body. And they got me to the emergency room. And it's kind of humorous part of the story where nobody would take me seriously because I, I walked into the emergency room and I'm like, you know, nobody would help me. And I'm like, I, you know, being an ex-cop, I'm like, I'm bleeding internally. I think I'm, I'm, I'm bleeding to death and I think I might be dying. And they're like, yeah, that's interesting. I'll go sit down, you know? And so when I finally got in there after half an hour in the emergency room, you imagine the pain I was in, they put me on a gurney and the doctor comes along and feels me and, and I scream and he screams out a bunch of cuss words and says, this man is dying on my table. And I'm like, I, li I literally looked up and go, that's what I'm trying to tell you people. <laughs> but uh, he, um, he said, look, you're bleeding internally, blah, blah. And, and uh, they, they did a CAT scan. And, and he said, um, listen, here's the deal. You, if you've damaged less than 40% of your liver, we're going to life flight you out of here. We're going to cut it out. It'll grow back. If you've damaged more than 40% of your liver, you have five hours to live. And then he walked out of the room. And, so I, and as he walked out, I said, wait a minute. Well, how will I die? Well, what do you mean? You won't have a liver. I said, well, but what kills me? Like, what does that mean? Right? And he said, well, your body will poison itself to death. And he walks out. So for an hour, I'm laying there like, okay, do I feel myself being poisoned to death? But um, the other thing that really struck me was you start to assess your life, right? So having faced death so many times in a sea of adrenaline, now I'm facing death laying on a gurney and waiting to, you know, die in a hospital bed, which at, I think I was like 30 years old. Uh, yeah, I was 30 years old. Um, not not means, how you envision going out. Right. And that means I'm 56 to save everybody the math. We're like, okay, 97. Um, but um and I remember I, I called my wife and left her a voicemail. Cell phones were relatively new, you know, and uh, I didn't want to mark, you know, she didn't answer the phone. So I'm like, hey, uh, if you're not doing anything, you might want to come down to the hospital. I'm here in the emergency room, <laughs> which afterwards she told me, don't ever do that to me again. If you're dying, let me know. But uh, they came in and after an hour and said, you know, good news, you, you ruptured your, your kidney, not your liver and, and you lacerated your liver and blah, blah, but you'll be fine. But during that hour, I got to thinking, okay, I'm 30. And I, I was raised very reformed, you know, Calvinist type, you know, don't do any good works because, you know, you, you, you've, God's picked you. And so you're, you know, um, but what are all the words about, you know, Jesus says in Revelation 22, behold, I'm coming quickly and my reward is given to each person according to what he has done. Well, what's that? You know, there's all these verses. And these were all hitting me because I was really a man of scripture. I really read God's word a lot, studied it, knew it very well. And as I'm lying there, you know, 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to be done for the deeds done in the body, whether good or worthless. This is for Christians, you know? So when you're now facing it in reality, it's like, oh, you know? And I lived a very good Christian life. I read the Bible. I went to Bible study. I went to church. I, you know, was a more moral and all those things. And it all rang hollow. It all rang. I kept thinking, Jesus might be saying to me in a few hours, what did you do with what I gave you? I gave you salvation. If we want to use a woke term, I gave you privilege. I, you know, you were raised by godly parents. You knew the Bible. You went to Christian schools. I got kicked out of Christian schools, but I did go to Christian schools. Um, what did you do with that? Who was saved because of you? Who was fed because you were on this earth? And I had to be honest and say, not many people. I didn't really stand out. I was no Billy Graham. You know, I was no George Whitfield. Um, and I remember at that point resolving, I will never be in this situation again. That, And, you know, when I've told this story, you know, I've been on some big TV shows and then see the flood of comments come in and people say, gosh, it sounds like he thinks his salvation is inadequate. Well, that's not the point at all. Jesus did it all on the cross. But what did I do with that free gift of salvation that he gave me? Who did I rescue from the fire? And that, it was in no way thinking my salvation was inadequate. But it was instead thinking, if I love my heavenly father and I love his children, what did I do with my life? That was the wake up moment at 30 years old of, I don't want to be a polite American Christian anymore. 
I want to wear myself out. I want to give everything I can so that when I get to heaven, the Lord says, well done, my good and faithful servant. And that ain't going to come from being a polite American Christian. That's going to come from being sold out for Christ. Hmm. Yeah, I love the quote. I can't remember if it was Leonard Ravenhill. I know it's on his tombstone here down the street from where I live, but it's only one life will soon be passed. He had some great quotes. And when I am dying, how happy I shall be if the light of my lamp has been burned out for thee. And, um, yeah, those type of moments like that, or it puts things in perspective really quick for you. I do think, as I started off by saying, we can be lulled into complacency. We can be lulled into who you're comparing yourself to, right? So as if a Christian... It's the, if it's the average Christian, that's not a very good comparison, Ken. <laughs> That's it, man. You know, I played small college basketball, you know? So I went from being a big basketball star in high school to getting to college and all of a sudden realizing, wow, these guys are way bigger and faster. And then, you know, I became a little bit of a star. And then I got invited to play for the Portland Trailblazers Pro-Am League. And uh, I was in no way good enough to play for the Trailblazers, but they just had a couple extra spots. <laughs> so... And then I got to that level and realized I didn't even belong on the court with these guys. I was just running around uh, with a really close view of guys flying by me and dunking over me. And um, so when you're in high school, it's really easy to have a big opinion of yourself because look at what a star I am. Look how many points I score. And then you get to college. Then you get to the big boys and you go, I'm a I'm a piece of garbage. Like, why am I even out here on this court with these guys? Same thing goes for life. If we begin, who are you comparing yourself to? And there's only one set of, there's only one place to judge and that's Jesus. How do I compare to Jesus? If I start comparing myself to Hal down at the, at the Home Depot, well, I feel pretty good. You know, if I start comparing myself to the average Christian these days, I can feel pretty good. But boy, when I start comparing myself to the perfect one who they nailed to the cross. And, uh, you know, that Jonathan Edwards quote, um, I've done, I've contributed nothing to my salvation, but the sin that nailed my savior to the cross. Mm. Yeah. It's a good one. Yeah. Well, you had another experience when you were preaching in Asia. <laughs> yeah. that uh, maybe just share that story as well. I, I found that yeah, there's a lot of great stories, but that was another one that kind of stood out to me. I've never, I've never had anybody ask about that story in all the interviews I've done. Uh, interestingly. Yeah. And I'll give you a little bit more details on it. Cause it's kind of cool. Um, my wife and I went in and it was the very um, really high crime area of Manila. And in fact, it was so bad that the taxi driver wouldn't drive us any further. He actually dropped us off. Cause he said, there's so many murderers here and we had to walk a mile, my wife and I through, you know, this area. And I mean, there were yeah, the poverty and the crime is, is too much to even describe. It was pretty, pretty bad. But we had a huge revival meeting and we had thousands of people on the street and witnessed to them. Now, they were they were used to Reinhard Bonnke and they were used to sort of big healing services. Well, that's, you know, I never I don't come from that sort of line of, you know, I'm a Calvary Chapel, Southern Baptist type, you know, Reformed Baptist type guy. So we, you know, we give the salvation message. We do an altar call. We have hundreds of people come forward, and I jump in the crowd and I'm walking around praying with people as are others. And all of a sudden, um, out of the crowd, I see this woman. She's probably thirty, and she's leading a woman that's probably seventy-five. And the woman is seriously lamed, like her her hip is something is broken, or I don't know what's going on, but it, her whole body is moving at a weird angle. She could barely walk. She drags herself up to me and she says, pastor, pastor, would you, would you heal my, my grandmother? And I don't remember if it was her mother or grandmother. And I, I was like, uh, and the daughter spoke English, but the, the older lady didn't. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I've never been in this situation and I'm kind of looking around. And so the, the daughter kind of stands over to the side respectfully. And so I get on my knees and I, I put my hands on this older woman's knee and that's about as high up as I was going to go. I, was, I think it probably was her hip, but I was like, you know, kind of put it on her knee. And, and, uh, and I said, Lord, 
you and I both know I have no idea what to do. <laughs> and I said, but if you don't heal this woman, you and I are both going to look really stupid right now. That's actually what I prayed. And I said, so please just heal her despite my complete inadequacy um, and my lack of faith. And that woman got healed. Uh, it was crazy. She jumped back for me. I don't know if she felt something or she seemed to feel something. And she started running through the crowd, like jumping up and down, screaming. And her, her daughter or granddaughter went running with her and they were jumping and created this call as everyone kind of looked and, whoa, there's a miraculous healing. Everybody started coming to me and I jumped up on the stage and I ran backstage and I hid <laughs> because I didn't know what else to do. I was like, I'm so glad I didn't let that old woman down. I don't want to let anybody, anybody else down, you know? And it was this, the story of the Lord did everything. Clearly, I even acknowledged to him, I don't even know what's going on. And, and he may have been willing, ready to pour out his spirit in an unbelievable way. And I was too much of a coward to stand in there and be the conduit that he wanted me to be. I ran and I hit. And I just wonder how many people got ripped off because of my lack of obedience and my lack of faith. Yes. I think we've all had circumstances like that where we think, God, why did not I speak up? Why did not I pray for this person? Why did not I give this person a... I felt an impulse. Why didn't I give this person something? Uh, and yeah. uh, we we shy away. We, uh, as you call it in your book, uh, we become cowardly for Christ. I think you quote Revelations. Is it Revelations twenty one eight? Yes. Yeah, that's one you don't hear preached often. Revelation twenty one eight. I speak on this a lot to uh, men. It says, you know, but the the cowards. Um, I don't know if I have the list all right, but the cowards, the murderers, the unbelievers, the adulterers, idolaters, the sexually perverse, and all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire forever and ever. And so, so it's interesting that God, on the list of people who for sure aren't saved, it starts with cowards and it ends with all liars. Boy, um, that's why I want to rescue people who think they're saved and who I go, I'm not your judge. But Jesus says, if you see your brother in sin, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. So we are not the judge, but we are to say, if God's word says this and you're acting like this, if I love you, it's my job to confront you in love and say, man, um, right, you, you, uh, you're you committing adultery on your wife. And the Bible says that if you're an adulterer, now that's, that says if you're typified by that. Now, I, I did a cowardly act by running and hiding when God could have used me, but it doesn't make me a coward. That means that's your lifestyle of being a coward. Everybody can be forgiven. And you look at the way the Lord has now so graciously put me in charge of Waterstone and Promise Keepers, despite my failure there. We'll all fail. He has a remarkable ability of using failed, flawed people. I had a, a guy I really love. I was on his TV show. And he said, boy, how does it feel by you know to be called by the Lord? to run promise keepers. And I go, well, the bad news is, you know, the good news is God called me to run promise keepers. The bad news is he only calls losers <laughs> because when you, when you look at scripture, everybody he calls to do something great is seriously flawed. <laughs> and so, you know, but the difference is, you know, Hebrews chapter 11, the, the, the hall of faith, the difference is he picks people who are deeply fault, but none of them ever back down from a fight. And those people flawed as they were he picks rahab the prostitute you know he picks um jehu who killed his daughter because he thought he was pleasing god i mean horrible horrible people but who once they got the call of the lord as flawed as they may be they went forward no matter what the cost and that's what he's looking for each one of us is he's our loving father and he will always love us and he will never cast us out of the family however he's also the king and the king is looking for his children to whom he can make co-inheritors with him, who he can trust to co-reign with him during the millennial age. Those who have given all will co-reign with him, Matthew chapter 24. But those who have not, those who have sought comfort, those who have been overcome by the world will not reign with him. Because as a loving father, when we're in the family, we stay in the family. But as the king, only those who have given all we'll get the full measure of rewards and crowns and reign with Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's true. That's good. 
Oh, about promise keepers, you know, there was kind of a, how it attracts all different, you know, you were talking about Reinhard Bunke and the cloth you're kind of cut from reform Baptist stuff. Right. Promise keepers really has, uh, it, it really reaches across all denominational lines. I believe I, I know I went to a event in Texas, I guess it was back in the nineties, maybe. And, uh, I mean, it was, of course it was at a big football stadium packed out, but that is really one of the things I think is, uh, kind of parachurch organizations uh, like promise keepers can do that. Maybe the local church, you know, can't really do as well because, you know, you know, this is my turf, this is your turf. It probably shouldn't be that way, but that's the way a lot of pastors feel. Uh, but, uh, I really like the story in the book where I know your friends with James Robinson. Well, James Robinson called up Billy Graham. He said, Billy, hey, what, Billy, what are you doing hanging out with Oral Roberts? And Billy, being the man of God that he was, he said, uh, James, do you know Oral? You know, we judge all these people. So maybe jump in there and share that story as well. I think it's great to, about brotherhood and you know, coming together as an organization of men uh, following Christ. James has become a, a massive uh, spiritual influence in my life. And because James really walked the road that I did many decades before me, he's about to turn 80. Um, James was a very, very well-known Southern Baptist pastor. For those who don't know, he has Life Today TV show and he was selling out huge re arenas and, and stadiums. And he really was supposed to be the next Billy Graham. And for those people who don't know James, you know, he was dispatched by Billy to talk Ronald Reagan into running for president in 1979. He was dispatched by Billy to go grab Franklin and say, you need to come back to Christ. I mean, it, James Robinson is a giant of the faith. And James was a Southern Baptist preacher who called up Billy Graham and said, why are you hanging out with those people? What's the matter with you? And Billy Graham said, um, James, do you know Oral? No. So will you do me a favor? Go spend a weekend with him. And uh, and then let me know how you feel. So James went down and spent three days with Oral Roberts in Tulsa. And they cried together and hugged each other. And this was back in the early 80s when men didn't do that. And uh, they ended up leaving best friends. And that completely changed James, changed James Robinson, in fact, to the point where James got rejected by a lot of his side of the aisle. And a lot of those guys, by the way, before they died, came to James and asked for his forgiveness for rejecting him. But he has been a massive unifier. We have to decide. So Promise Keepers, it's a, it's a very interesting conundrum, honestly, Ken. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an incredibly trusted name. And it's one that I didn't build. Coach McCartney built it and, and a lot of other guys with him, Randy Phillips and things. So I feel a great burden to make sure that I don't do anything that would hurt the name of Promise Keepers. At the same time, we live in a very compromised world and a very different world from the 90s where um, it's important that we take the right biblical stances. And which are they? Where, where, what hills are you going to die on, as, as my friend Sam Rodriguez would say? It's funny because the people who are now saying, well, you know, you've taken this stand on homosexuality. How dare you? You know, Promise Keepers never did that in the 90s. They're dead wrong. Um, there's a when you Google promise keepers, one of the first things you'll see is Coach McCartney yelling into the camera, homosexuality is an abomination. So <laughs> we're we're doing it more gently than he did. Um, you know, and there are there are doctrinal issues that I'm very passionate about that I won't take a stand on because that's not our calling. But parachurch ministries, you have to remember the church is supposed to be a gathering of of believers locally. It was meeting in people's homes in the book of Acts, right? Now, the fact that some churches have become massive doesn't change what the what the church is supposed to be, a gathering of local believers. A parachurch ministry is simply coming in saying, let's take what y'all are doing all over the country, and let's talk into issues that maybe you can't talk into on, on your own as well. You know, So you have crew, right? You have college campuses, right? You have Young Life. You have all these great ministries. Promise Keeper's job is to talk to men like men. And we don't have enough of that in today's church. There's a lot of hip, hip, you know, hypocritical pastors, as we've talked about. But also, even for the good pastors, pornography is destroying the church, the family, and America today. 
Well, it's difficult to have a really candid conversation about what pornography does to you from the pulpit to a mixed audience, right? And a lot of pastors are struggling with that sin, or they don't have the capability of speaking about it. And that's one of the things that we can talk into in, a, in as Promise Keepers, and we do talk into, is we did a, an hour-long special on sexual integrity that people can find on the Promise Keepers app or on our website. And we've had 5,000 men. So we had 250,000 men watch it live. And then we had 5,000 men so far. It's probably more than that now. Go through the sexual uh, healing, that the uh, pornography addiction thing. 30-day challenge. Massive amount of letters from men saying, I've finally been delivered from this. I've been addicted since I was nine. So it's it's a huge problem. There's other sides to it as well, though. I, and I've said, you know, to have a healthy family, you have to have a father and a mother, both. And we live in a country that's more and more only a mother. And we actually have a lot of churches that are sort of like that too. Like a mother is very necessary to little Johnny because when little Johnny falls down and skins his knee, you know, mom's going to say, let me kiss it. Let me put some back teen on it. It's going to be better, you know, while Johnny cries. And, and that's, you need to have that. However, you also need dad who sometimes little Johnny's kind of overreacting. And dad says, get up, rub some dirt on it and get going, suck a crime. And that's also necessary. And the problem is we have too many young boys raised by only mom and who haven't ever heard, knock it off, stop your whining, right? The same, I think in the church, we need to have, um, because the church has become very feminized in many ways, and that is not all bad. I'm just, it's just a statement of fact. We need that counterbalance of men to go, okay, so you had a bad father. Okay, so you were born in poverty okay you know all these things that sucks now what are you gonna do about it because that's what men need to bring to the table and that's i think promise keepers role is to stay start acting like a man you may have had some disadvantages and we all acknowledge those and those disadvantages by the way will give you some strengths but what are you gonna do with what you got man let's go your family's counting on you because we have too many men sitting around whining today about what they don't have that's I can't think of anything less masculine than whining about what you don't have. Yeah, for sure. You even see, unfortunately, you see uh, pastors, and you know, if there's some of them that are honest with you, they'll share with you that they're they have the culture has reached such a point that the pastor is scared to preach about biblical marriage or biblical sexuality because maybe the people that are listening to him are not. Uh, gay, lesbian, or whatever, but maybe their daughter is, or maybe their son is, or a family member somewhere. And so these pastors, you know, uh, they're scared to lose those members by taking a stance on something that's, um, you know, just black and white in the scripture. They don't want to lose the tie. They don't want to offend these people. So, you know, they're not even preaching sermons from the pulpit about it. You know what they ought to be a lot more afraid of is losing someone to hell because they didn't give them the truth. I mean, it's easy to be complacent. I realize churches have mortgages to pay and and pastors are trying to make a living. I, I do get that. And um, But boy, as again, going back to Malachi chapter three now, we recorded Malachi chapter two and now Malachi chapter three. God says, you do what I told you to do and watch your storehouses get full. If you take the risks and you do all for the Lord, he will always take care of you. And boy, and I did, I did say in that interview on CBN about Belmont, um, there was a mega church pastor who I challenged has having not spoke out on abortion. This was in 2020 during the election, you know, and I was having a lot of pastors call me. A lot of well-known guys were saying, um, who do I vote for? Tell me. Who do I vote for? You know, I can't vote for Biden, but I can't vote for Trump, you know, and all that sort of thing. And I was talking to this pastor about not speaking out on abortion. He said, Ken, you don't understand. I have this huge church. And if I speak out on abortion, people will think it's political. And I'll be, I mean, I, I, could, I could lose my job, you know. And I challenged him in a loving way. And I said, if one girl kills her baby, has an abortion, and because you didn't tell the truth, she didn't know it was murder. You, her pastor, never made it clear. The blood is on your hands. 
And people say, gosh, Ken, that's kind of harsh. That's exactly what the Lord says to Ezekiel. Hey, if you don't tell the people, I'm holding you responsible, right? And and that he had a hard, I mean, he had a hard time with that. I I, I consider part of my responsibility and calling is to give guys hard truths. And um a year later he did preach on that, and it was a, a pretty huge thing, and his church grew. <laughs> so not only did it shrink, I, and I do think 2020 was a big revealer of which churches really stood by the Lord and which ones don't. I mean, there's a church in a major city with some guys came to me. It, the church was the biggest church in that city, huge auditorium, $80 million uh, property. It's nobody goes there anymore. They went totally woke during COVID. They did everything the governor told them to do. People have left. And now the conservative evangelical churches are have grown and taken all those people away. Again, it, if you're just preaching what the government's preaching, what culture's preaching, what good are you? Who, why, why would anybody want to go to that? You know, I mean, what's the truth? What's real? Because, you know, and, and people are listening to this go, well, you know, what, why, why do you say that? Well, because right now we have 127 suicides to, in a day in America. 80% of those are middle-aged men. We see growing discontent, misery, um, Gosh, the transgender movement that's being used, you know, confused people are being used by others that want to make money and make a movement off of them. And people are looking for truth, joy, peace. Where is it? Because I ain't finding it anywhere in this culture. You're right, you're not. But then if you go to church and it's the same thing, there's no healing there. When you go to her church and you hear the word of God, then you're left with a choice. Do I obey it or do I not? And that is what Christianity is always about. Now, I was on a, an interview recently, and someone said, you know, would you outlaw homosexuality if you could? Absolutely not. I would not. Christianity is about the freedom to make a choice. It is a part of the the, the religious um, influence we have that, that it's always wrong, the pharisaical thing that wants to make people conform to be like us. That's not our job. Our job is to give truth and offer choice. And so to force people behind the scenes or and one of the re- things I love about our cultural disintegration right now is that people are who they really are. And therefore we can deal with them more at a face value and say, here really is the truth. Instead of having a fake religious, um, like we did in the fifties and it, the fifties also were more godly. I'm not putting it down, but I am saying there are a lot of people who are simply cultural Christians back in those days. Cause that's what you had to be. There's something about today where people have the freedom to be who they want to now say, I know who needs Jesus. They're not faking. I can see it, you know, and I can go out and give them God's word. So the church needs to be a place where people come, we give them the truth, and we offer a choice to follow Jesus or not. And it ought to be so blatant. I think I said this in the book. It ought to be so blatant that those people who don't want to choose Jesus would be so uncomfortable they'd never come back. This secret friendly church idea where we milly mally around the truth to try to get the church big. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to help. No, here's the word of God in grace and truth. And if you're the kind of person that says God may be this way and I ain't going to change, they should never want to come back to your church because you're tr- preaching the truth with clarity um, and grace. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. I think nowadays it, <clears throat> it's so radical to be a really biblical Christian uh, you, you are going to stand out. If you're, if you're absolutely sold out to Christ, you're going to be so different. You're not going to be like these other people. When you walk into a restaurant, when you walk into the mall or wherever you're at, you're, you're going to carry the spirit of Christ with you, not the spirit of the world, not the spirit of the antichrist. And you're just going to be different. And, uh, you know, you just need to man up and accept that and, and stand up for Christ. Uh, this is not a time uh, nor the hour for, you know, people that are going to be on the fence like they were in the days of Elijah. You know, who are you going to serve? Is it going to be God or is it going to be Baal? You know, people need to, um, you know, have firm convictions about what they believe, why they believe it. You know, um, not being encouraging, but being real. Um when when the church doesn't stand up with people, they end up being on their own. I mean, I remind people all the time, you really want to be godly? You really want to stand with him? Look at the Apostle Paul. When he died, he was all alone. I mean, in 2 Timothy, which is his last book before he's beheaded, he says, I got nobody. I mean, he wrote Romans 
15, 20 years earlier. Here he is in Rome, and there's nobody. He says to Timothy, would you mind coming all the way across the Mediterranean so you can bring my coat to me because I'm cold? Like, that, you're all I got, man. I mean, so you think about the Apostle Paul. I mean, the, how the effect he had, and when he died, he was alone. Now, Peter had already been killed, and James had been killed. So a lot of those who really stood with him had already been killed. But he wrote the book of Romans to the Roman church, and where were all those people when Paul was in prison? And you look at Jeremiah, you look at Isaiah. I mean, Jeremiah's life is just a series of just misery. Um, and yet, this life is so temporary. God says, you're like a vapor. You're like a, a blade of grass that springs up in the morning and withers in the noonday sun. That is the extent of your life compared to eternity. You, you want to put all your, your eggs in the basket of this life, or do you want to invest them in eternity? And when you do, you may or may not have any friends. Now, I will say, we are still a strong enough nation in Christ that I have more close friends today than I have my whole life. Now, I get a lot of hate mail. I get a lot of people coming after me. Um, but boy, Sam Rodriguez and A.R. Bernard and Chad Hennings and Steve Berger and Donald Bergs, these guys from the Board of Promise Keepers are my brothers. And uh, I, I thank the Lord that I have so many close relationships. But that's kind of partially been forged in the fact that we've all had to go through so much stuff together. And, you know, one of the things I missed when I left the LAPD was um, the camaraderie of the men. And, you know, when you showed up in the locker room, you started putting on your uniform and guys cutting up and then you go to roll call. And they were talking about all the crimes the, the day before and for 45 minutes, we'd make fun of each other and throw stuff at each other. And, uh, and then we go hit the streets and we knew I mean, it was such high crime back in those days, and I guess it still is, but there was a camaraderie there that I missed when I left. Well, that's coming back now to a lot of the people. If you want to give all in the church, there's a camaraderie there when you get the hatred, when you're having to stand up against mega church pastors in some regards who want to cancel promise keepers. There's a camaraderie there that I would not give up. And I would encourage people who are watching and listening to this to say, if you follow Christ with everything in you, you will be hated by the world. But one of the great things about it is you will have closer relationships and friendships with people who genuinely love you than you ever had before. And I'd take that any day over the little plate relationships and acceptance by the world any day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What would you say to men that are sitting in the pew? I know like, you know, just businessman. I feel like sometimes the churches or the pastors, you know, they, it's like, uh, you know, just, y'all just put, you fund everything, put your check in there and let's, you know, let's, let's, <laughs> and so, but I think a lot of these men are, are frustrated. A lot, a lot of people I know are because they feel like, you know, God has called me to much more than this and to be uh, throwing, uh, you know, throwing my money in the plate every Sunday. Um, maybe speak to them. You know, that's a, a big call. You're right. Uh, it's one of the reasons we put this app together. Guys can go to the app store and get the Promise Keepers app. Um, and the point of that app was, number one, to give good doctrinal content so that guys can see what, you know, God's word. And we have good stuff to read on there and great videos and all that. But number two, it's to get guys into relationship because we have an epidemic of the friendless American male. And I've, I've talked a lot about this where, Men make relationships by doing, and women make relationships by communicating, right? So women can get together and have tea, and they can come over and have a visit. I mean, if I went over to your house to have a visit, that's weird, because men don't have a visit, right? If we want to have a relationship, we go hunting together, we go to a ball game, we go play basketball, we play golf, whatever it might be. And there's not enough of that anymore, because there's so much time constraint on men. And so in the app, we have gotten venues for the ability for men to get together in the local community. So if someone's living in, in um, you know, Orlando, Florida, they can get on there and find other guys in Orlando who have common interests and have a relationship around doing. And we're saying, don't make the relationship around Bible study. Make the relationship about common interests and Bible study will come from it, right? Because there's too much of this obligation. I'll meet you at 6.30 at Starbucks in the morning. And we'll do Bible study for an hour and then we'll go off to work. You can do that for 20 years and not have a real relationship or friendship with a man. But I'll tell you what, 
when you go out and go fishing with a guy and a great fish gets away and he blurts out a cuss word and looks around and everybody laughs at him, there's something about that that makes a friendship. I'm not saying go cuss. I'm just saying, you know, it's you see what man a man's really made out of. So the problem with the church is that it is not a place genuinely, generally to make friends. It's a place that you can meet people, but you got to be intentional about going out and making friends. And the second thing I would say is no one's responsible for your faith, but you. A lot of these churches are really weak. You can go there and you want to bring your kids there. And a lot of guys go to churches they don't really like, but the youth group's good for their kids or all that. Okay. But then you have to be intentional about making something good there. And I would say to men all the time, and I hear this all the time, Ken, I don't go to church because I don't get anything out of it. And I will always say back to them, you might be right. Who said you were supposed to get something out of it? Who said it was about you? You go to church to give, not to take. So what can you give? And it's amazing. If you go to church with the idea of what can I give, what you'll get. But as long as you're standing there going, well, you know, let me judge the pastor and the music. And after church, I'll criticize them to my wife and my kids and teach them how to be critics because I didn't like that one song or I didn't like what that pastor said. Uh -uh. Go to church. If that's a church you've chosen to take your family to, shut your mouth about being critical and say, what can I do? And I'll tell you, when I'm at church and I go to a little cowboy church um, in, in Colorado, I go and I look around for who needs prayer, who is miserable, who can I minister to, not what did the pastor say or how good was the music? Because the music in my church ain't very good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It's a bunch of bunch of not very talented people up there singing their hearts out for Jesus. It's something about it I love because it's just genuine. They're not talented, but boy, they're genuine. And I'll take that any day. Mm -hmm. I think that's like Jesus. You know, he did. Jesus didn't pick the twelve. Uh, you know, from the seminary, so to speak. He went out and got some rough and tumble guys. You know, fishermen, yeah. tax collectors. You know, terrorists, and that's that was his band. Uh, a band of men right there. Um, uh, so yeah, he, he, uh, definitely pull, pulls from that pool. Uh, tell us a little bit about promise keepers and, you know, I know there was kind of a law there and you've taken over and maybe some of the events that you've got upcoming and, um, you know, maybe just, uh, about the website and where people can reach you if they want to, you know, get connected or if they want to donate some money or those type things. Yeah. Promisekeepers.org is the website and then the app um the app's being rebuilt right now so it's good it has a few glitches but it's really still pretty good there's about sixty thousand men on it right now that are really actively using it and so it's a, definitely a place where you can find some support and some good teaching um the tour we're doing is really about that we we did an event at dallas cowboy stadium two years ago it was it was phenomenal we had about thirty thousand guys there according to the washington post and the reason i say that is because um, we scholarshiped a bunch of tickets. So I think between sales and scholarships, we had like 35,000 tickets, but so the scholarships, we didn't keep track. So it was about 30,000 guys there and it went really, really well, but it's a monstrous amount of work to put on an event at a stadium like that. And I'm at monstrous cost. So we thought, well, it'd be better. What if we, what if we hit lots of cities and smaller venues like churches and small colleges where they already have all the equipment there and then we can just show up and do a, a small event. Now we, like I said, we've been getting canceled and, and I'm going to, we'll put this out here pretty soon. A lot of churches have said, welcome to sin. We'd love to have you. And then, oh, whoa, whoa, we're going to get picketers. People might be upset with us. We don't want you anymore after spending a lot of time with them. So we're now going out and I'm learning my lessons of, okay, I tried to just be open-minded to churches. Now I'm having to say, pastor, are you in agreement with us? Because this is what we stand for. And if you're not, let's just move on. Don't waste my time. And we're actually getting way better venues now that I've learned to not, you know, look, the left is all about, let's have a conversation. Let's be tolerant until you, until you disagree with them. And then they're, they're not so much that way. And that's what we're learning is that they would love the idea of having promise keepers there until they realize that maybe there's some controversy and then they went running for the hills. So we're being a little more particular. We're putting a tour together. It'll go all through 24. It's called the daring faith tour, you know, all the book. But it's really about that. It's calling men out to stand up for Christ with boldness. It'll be a Friday night only event. So a mini Promise Keepers event. 
And we're going to have some really great stuff there, helping men with what they need help with. One of the little segments we're going to have is how do I deal with the, the this culture when it comes to sexuality? And what if my son or daughter comes to me and has, has a tough question? We're going to take those on for men in scripture so that they really are getting some real meat out of these things. The real goal is to get these guys on the app. Promise keepers will continue to be unrelenting and unbendable when it comes to God's word. We just, I don't know why else we'd want to do this if we weren't going to really change men for Christ, right? What's the point? So there's that. Um, I believe the culture's getting ready to change. Whether it's for good or bad, I think depends on the church. You know, Francis Schaeffer used to have a statement, you know, about abortion. He used to say, every church ought to have a sign, or excuse me, every abortion clinic ought to have a sign in front of it that says, continues to be opened by permission of the Church of Jesus Christ. Right? When the church stands up boldly, it massively affects culture, especially when it's as big as it is in America. I believe we're about to go through a revival or a revolution. I believe... If the church does this job, if we preach God's word, we will go through revival in America. We'll see the blessings, continued blessings of the Lord, and we will see a loving, peaceful, unified country. If we don't, when you look at the road we're on, I believe that we are headed for a monstrous destruction. All you got to do is look at history, the constant upheaval. People throughout history have thought, well, this is how things are today, so this is how they'll always be. And then suddenly the enemy comes and crashes the gates down. And, you know, to think America is going to be any different, especially when you look at what's going on right now, the hatred and the anger that it's, I think it's coming from people who don't know what the truth is and can't find somebody who will, will declare it to them. So I believe we, we stand at a crossroads of history. You know, uh, William F. Buckley said that there are moments in history who required a man to stand on the road and say this far and no more. And I believe that we're there, and that man is the church. Will we or won't we stand strong? So we at Promise Keepers are going to do everything we can to teach men what the truth is and how to stand strong. And so they can start on our website, and I can also tell you that we are in negotiations to come to. We are going to New York on December 1st. Um, we're in negotiations to go to Orlando, Tampa, Seattle, Chicago, um, Southern California, Houston, um, I'm forgetting a few other places, but li likely will be um, within the next year to year and a half and a place near everyone watching this. And I would say, please come and please bring other people. And I will bring up one other thing, Ken. One of the, one of the letters I get, not a lot, but I do get criticism from some, why do we charge people to come? Promise Keepers actually did, uh, we tried to do free for a while and we found that men don't value what they don't pay for. So we don't charge. I don't get any money from promise keepers. I take nothing. No one's trying to get rich. We charge men because if they don't have skin in the game, then they they will grab the tickets, make a commitment, and then not show up. And you'll end up with a half-empty sanctuary. So what I say to people is we do charge because of that. And if you're concerned about the poor coming as we are, then buy three tickets, one for yourself and, and scholarship two that we can give to people. But we've learned it's a catastrophe if we try to make these things free because men will grab up the tickets and then not show up. Absolutely. And I also uh, don't want to fail to mention the New York event. Now, churches can sign up and do a simulcast for that event. That's free. So we are global simulcast. We will probably have, I would say, four to 5,000 churches throughout the world watching that event on December 1st. So if you're not in New York sign up and get the simulcast everything is free and call your men together and watch that event and it will be three hours of absolute whoa like this is amazing teaching that's powerful well i appreciate your time today ken and uh talking to you and we'll we'll put all the links in the description box about your books promise keepers and all that so cool i've appreciated this thank you